the impossible task. If ever you have studied story or fairy tales, especially, uh, there is, or Joseph Campbell was very famous, you had this idea of the impossible task or the hero's journey, which means stories, uh, most especially with fairy stories, where the task that the protagonist has to accomplish is something that's impossible. A very good example is Star Wars. I'm hoping everybody's seen Star Wars, right? Has anybody not seen the original Star Wars? You're, not, you're too ashamed to raise your hand. Uh. <laughs> uh, Star Wars was written according to advice from Joseph Campbell, who was, uh, studied, spent his life studying uh, how story works, and especially this hero's journey. And the original notes by Joseph Campbell, actually on the internet, that he gave to George Lucas, who was writing Star Wars. And in Star Wars, you have this young guy, Luke Skywalker, and he's just a simple farm boy. And you have an empire, an evil empire, that rules the galaxy. And the farm boy is going to have to take down the evil empire. Impossible task. No way that could ever come about. That's what the hero's journey is about, an impossible task. So many, many stories, many, many movies uh, have this theme that they will let the reader or watcher know that this is what you're going to have to do and it's impossible, but you will find a way to do it. So this, the reason why this impossible task is such a common theme in story is that our own inward journey is an impossible task. If you think about the task of enlightenment, to give up all desire, it doesn't make any sense, really, does it? Do you think you can do that? Isn't even giving up desire, isn't that another desire? Aren't you just going to get confused? Don't you desire to go to the bathroom? Do you desire to do your practice? Do you, it just gets confusing. This mind that jumps around and wanders away, well, is there any way that there is a different way for the mind to be? We were looking at this sutta the other day that even if two people came and sawed off your arms and legs with a two-handled saw, your mind would not give rise to a moment of hatred. <laughs> How's that for an impossible task? I was saying I get um, going to the airport going to the airport, coming here, and the, the, I couldn't sit in the back because there was no seatbelt, so I sat in the front, right next to the driver, two inches away, and the whole way there, he had his finger up his nose, his little finger, and he kept examining it, and then, <laughs> I'm like, I'm sitting right next to you. I'm thinking, forget sawing my arms and legs off with a two-handled saw, I can't even forgive this poor driver. <laughs> It's an impossible task, getting enlightened. All enlightenment traditions, it's not only Buddhism has the story of enlightenment. Uh, it's not only India, there's a lot in India, but all over the world we've had this story of enlightenment has cropped up and popped out in different ways. So the impossible task is usually accomplished by something very humble something that the uh, protagonist does that seems very simple, but will come back to help them. Uh, one of my favorite stories, which I won't give you today, but um, in this story was the two older brothers and the younger, insignificant brother. And you already know, right, who the hero of the story is. I've only said that much. Do you think it's one of the two older brothers? No, it's impossible, right? So the three of them are walking along and they see an ant's nest and the two older brothers want to kick the ant's nest over and make the ants go scurrying around. And the younger one says, no, I will not suffer you to harm these ants. And then they move on. But you just know, or a child knows listening to that story, that little action that the young insignificant brother has done is what's going to help them later on. And so later on, uh, in that particular story, the uh, two older brothers have been turned to stone 
and only the younger brother is left alive. And he's given a task. He has to, uh, the princess had lost a string of a hundred pearls and they'd been scattered in the forest and he has to find all 100 pearls. Otherwise, he gets turned to stone and the whole kingdom remains a stone and everybody loses. So he goes out and he cries. And as he's crying, who comes to help him? Right, so the little ant comes along and says, I'll help you. And the ants can scurry around in the forest and find all the pearls and that's how he solves the problem. Now, the reason for this is that the impossible task is not completed by an impossible action. The impossible task is completed by what seems like very humble, small actions. So even though enlightenment seems like we don't even understand what it is, or where it is, or how it is, or how I could do it, how could I ever have the kind of mind that we talk about when we talk about enlightened beings? But actually, your practice is not that difficult. These small, humble actions that you do will, have, will come into being, come into effect later on. One of these stories is my favorite story, Jack and the Beanstalk. But one reason I'm so, I love this story so much is because about, I don't know, about eight years ago, I did the story of Jack and the Beanstalk here with the youth group. At that time, the youths were very young. They're, they're a bit bigger now. <laughs> <laughs> and so I told the story, then I explained what it means and how it works. And I'm never sure if people really get it. I love fairy tales, so to me, it's just beautiful. But I never know if I'm boring people, like, or in, in Singapore, if you really were told fairy tales. You had different stories, right? Chinese stories and things. So I'm never sure if, if it really works when I do this. Anyway, uh, Winnie was here and she loved it. She we didn't care what the youth think. She was like, yeah, this, come back. So I did this story and a few years later, maybe about four or five years later, I was back in Singapore and I'd started to take the trains, trying to find my way around. The only way to find your way around in a city is taking public transport. So you get to know where things are and how big the place is. I'd gone to meet some people on the public transport and I'd gotten off the train at the wrong stop. And I knew I was one stop away from where I had to be. So I dashed back onto the railway. I got up to the track. But I don't know if I need to go one stop that way or one stop this way. And your signs actually are not that intuitive. <laughs> well, once you know what you're doing, then it's obvious. But it's not obvious when you don't know what you're doing. And as getting a little bit late, and I, I was like, well, which way do I go? I did the obvious thing, I just asked somebody. And I said, excuse me, which platform? And they went, like this. I'm like, I haven't even asked my question yet. <laughs> so I asked somebody else, and they just put their head down, and I'm like, that, that's really strange. So I asked about 10 people, and nobody would answer me. Very strange. I don't know if you've had sign of fake monks or Hare Krishnas <laughs> at that railway station trying to get money out of people or sell books or something. I just want to know which stage, which platform I go on. And I was a bit discombobulated because, well, what? You like that word? <laughs> a bit confused. Because what do you do if you can't ask people like a simple thing? And I was, I was thinking, I always come to Singapore, and Singaporeans are always really nice people. And now I'm having a very different experience. And I, I really didn't know what to do. And then the guy tapped me on the shoulder. He said, well, do you need some help? I said, yeah, I need, just need to know. Is, I think it's Queensbury or Queensland or something. Queenstown. Queenstown. Is it that way, one stop that way, or one stop this way? He said, oh, it's that way. I'm like, thanks. That's, that was so easy that I can't, couldn't understand why it had been so difficult. 
So we get on the train, and he gets on the train behind me. And I said, this is just really weird that nobody would stop and help me. Like, what? am I missing something? And then he came over to help me when I didn't even ask him. And he said, oh, it's because I was at your talk at Jack on the Beanstalk. <laughs> so, just like the little kid didn't allow the ants to be kicked over and it came back to help him, I gave my story on Jack and the Beanstalk and a few years later it comes back to help me on the train. In Jack and the Beanstalk you have a very interesting motif uh, or storyline and I'm not going to do the whole story but I, I presume most of you are familiar in some way, right? Um, it is actually a spiritual classic but I would have to spend some time to convince you. Uh, the one motif in this story that I want to point to is the point where Jack takes the cow to be sold in the market. And he, as he takes his cow there, a stranger stops him and says, where are you going with your cow? Now, a cow represents the world. It's a motherly figure, and it's a milk-giving figure, which means it keeps you alive, but it doesn't get you enlightened. So the motif is that at some point, everyone who's going to spiritually progress has to give up the world, the, the thing that nurtures. On a personal level, that means that you have to, as you're growing up, at that time, be 14, 15, now it's a bit older, at some point you have to leave the house and go and fend for yourself. So this is giving up that nurturing that thing that nurtures and being willing to step out into the world. But the Jack and the Beanstalk story was talking about the inward journey. So Jack goes to sell the cow and he meets a stranger on the street. Now you, you should know, just like every child would know hearing this story, that that stranger is significant. This is no coincidence. And the, sto the stranger... Um, says, where are you going with the cow? He says, I'm going to sell it. He says, okay, uh, answer me a question and I will uh, buy the cow from you. Jack says, fine. And then it comes out with what I think is the greatest line in any literature or any story. Forget Tolstoy and Shakespeare and Jackie Collins and all these people. <laughs> Forget... <laughs> They don't know who Jackie Collins is, do they? <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Uh, J.K. Rowling, I'd have to say. If I don't know. Okay. It comes out with the greatest line in literature ever. The, the stranger says to Jack, how many beans make five? Oh, such a good line. And Jack, quick as a flash, says, two in each hand and one in the mouth. And the stranger says, you're right, I'll buy your cow, and gives him five beans. Right. So you, you should know that in stories, when there's something a little odd like that, it has a meaning, right? Uh, you know the meaning, how many beans make five? What's your answer, by the way? I shouldn't have told you the right answer, should I? <laughs> how many beans make five? Well, you know the answer now. Two in each hand, one in the mouth. So what this means is, this is the five senses. You're giving up the world of manifold appearances. So there's hundreds of millions of different kinds of food and tastes. There's hundreds of millions of different kinds of music and sounds. There's hundreds of millions of kinds of people. I mean, there is no limit to the size of the world. But when you bring your attention back in, what do you have? You have five senses. You have sight, sound, smell, touch, and feeling. That's it. That's all you have. So two in each hand, one in the mouth, means that your senses actually are paired, right? Your ears and your eyes, even your nostrils, your body is paired. But only your mouth has one. So two in each hand, one in the mouth, means your five senses. And this is what happens when we do our meditation, is we come back, we trade the world in, 
all the beautiful, joyful, happy things in the world. We're trading for just these five things. So what happens when Jack gets home with five beans? His mother claps him around the head and sends him to bed without dinner. So when we bring the attention inwards, this is what's happening, is we go into what we call the desert, which means you go into a, a deprivation almost of the senses. You could have spent this afternoon on Sentosa Island, right? In all the arcade games, playing things, doing things that are entertaining. I went there the other day for the first time. I, was, I like it. I like the thing. They had a um, flying chamber, right, where you go in and you fly. I thought in the robes that would be really easy to <laughs> fly up into the air. <laughs> And you've given all of that up for what? When the eye goes out to something you can see, you restrain it and bring your attention back. When your consciousness goes out to things to eat, real or imagined, past, future or present, you restrain it and bring your attention back. When your mind goes out and gets stationed in your body, you restrain it and bring your attention back. You just have these five beings. That's the entire world, entire existence. And when you do, you've given up all those exciting things, so you've moved into the desert. You've moved into that process of renunciation, which at first is going to be a little difficult, a little deprived, until the magic starts to happen, until the beans grow and you go up to the magic kingdom. So this uh, motif, I like to... It appears many times through many stories, and this is the, the small deeds that you plant now, the small things that you do now, will have their effect later on. And that is a matter of um, faith to some degree. It's a matter of trust that in engaging in this practice, we are going to start to awaken in ways that you can't imagine. And very importantly, it will be awakening in ways that you can't manufacture. So, for example, uh, if I want to be um, I don't know, a, a guitar player, a pool player, and play pool and be a world championship pool player. Um, you know, British people, we like sports that you can do in a pub. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't like sports where you have to go outside onto freezing cold fields and stuff like that. In fact, when I was at school, I learned very early. Our, our playing fields were separate to the school, like a 10-minute walk away. And I figured out that on the 10 minute walk down there, if I hop into a hedge and never show my face from the first day of semester, the sports teacher will never know that I'm absent. <laughs> <laughs> so if I want to be a, a pool player, I can exert my ego, right? I can exert my force of will, my effort. Uh, I know what to do. I can make myself be a better pool player but with meditation uh, or the spiritual growth, you're going to have to attain to things that your will can't manufacture. If I'm going to say, going to be a really nice person, you can do it by force of ego, by force of will, for a little while, but quite quickly you'll feel yourself and probably people will see you as being a bit fake. You can say, yeah, oh, I'm so beautiful, I'm going to bestow my blessings on people and you know, a lot of uh, <laughs> young monks in Thailand, when they ordain, they come in as kids and they're playing around and they're like, uh, and then they ordain as monks and suddenly they're like, <laughs> very serene, carrying their bowl around. And they're, they're playing a role, right? This, they're not really serene. They're just, it's a force of will, of ego. And that's okay. That's where you start. There's no criticism. I've been there myself. But if you're going to change, then this change is going to happen in ways that you can't manufacture. So what we do is we start doing this very simple, very humble practice and trust that this practice is going to start to change you uh, in amazing ways, open up in, in, in amazing ways, give you amazing insights that are things that you may know in your head, but you don't know yet in your heart. 
and then these things will start to manifest if you do the practice. Uh, practice is quite straightforward, as I mentioned this morning, uh, about attention getting stationed at things. And you know, when I, even 10 years ago, I had a lot of Dharma talks. I had a big long list, and when I was invited somewhere, I'd send you the list. You can pick your, off your list of like 200 Dharma talks. And now I'm whittling it down, and I really think quite soon I'm only going to have one left. <laughs> and that's this very simple uh, talk, or this very simple mechanism, that what happens with the mind is it will, consciousness will go and get stationed somewhere with what you're doing. So you're driving your car, but you're thinking about whatever you're thinking about, your holiday in Scotland that you're going to have, and you're driving your car, your, your consciousness gets stationed in, in Scotland. And then what happens is you come back, okay, and then you start dreaming about something else. You know, how I'm going to help Britain this get out of the European <laughs> Union. And then uh, that's for a while, and then you get out of your car and you go for a sandwich, and then you'll stay, your consciousness is stationed with your sandwich. And while you're thinking about your sandwich, you're not thinking about Britain leaving the EU, you're not thinking about Buddhism, you're not thinking about your children, you, you're on that sandwich. That's it, your whole world gets condensed down to a sandwich. This is why that I'm also very clear when you make an action on the holy life, you make clear that I dedicate this action to the holy life for my own enlightenment and for helping and bringing other people uh, to enlightenment also. And every time you make that resolution, it kind of strengthens somewhere in your heart that your ego can't really touch. One story I have about this was my, in my temple when I first ordained. I was in a, uh, it wasn't a forest temple, but it, like a countryside temple. And uh, it was fairly well run, fairly well supplied, but a lot of things, you know, one of the toughest things that you wouldn't think of unless you've done it is diet. You people, all of you like to eat the food that you like, and you don't like to just eat the food that you're given. And the first rule for monks is you have to receive whatever people give you. You don't have to eat whatever people give you. You have to receive it. It's different, right? <laughs> so people give me chicken and then I go and give it to the cats. So I make an extended dana that I give <laughs> out because I don't want to eat, eat meat. So not getting what you want. When you think about ordination, you think, I'm going to be serene, I'm going to get enlightened, I'm going to do my practice, and you're not. You're going to sit there moaning to yourself because you can't get the food that you want. That's the reality of it. So, a lot of things that you, didn't, that you don't get in the temple at that time. Uh, it's a lot bigger and wealthier now, and you get, they even have shops inside and all sorts of things. I went back there recently because my teacher died. So, I was on my way to the sala to get my lunch one day, and there was uh, a woman there, and she, was, she had some cans of Coke. I'm like, ah. white rice and chicken every day for food and then fruit, they had quite a lot of fruit and I like fruit so I'm happy with that but a can of coke was like, oh, <laughs> yes. And not only that, but the can of coke was cold. <laughs> Do you know how many hot things that people bring but it's cold by the time they give us? And how many cold things people bring but it's melted by the time they give us? And this can of coke was cold, I'm like, yes. So. I saw her there and I kind of, I was walking along with my bowl and I kind of deviated <laughs> around a little bit. And then she saw oh, Bante and put the can of Coke and I'm very serene. <laughs> and I take this can of Coke and just as I'm walking away and I look ahead of myself, very serene, walking very mindfully. And you know what I saw? I saw the worst thing I could possibly see at that moment in time. 
one of the little novices, and he was standing there with his big eyes looking at my can of Coke. <laughs> What can I do? <laughs> I'm supposed to be practicing for enlightenment, to give enlightenment to all world beings and my compassion and universal loving kindness. I'm like, get out of the way. <laughs> like, so I just stood there in front of me and, oh, God. <laughs> I got the can of Coke. Here you go. <laughs> now, if I drank that can of Coke, say the novice had not appeared, and I drank the can of Coke, would I remember that now? Would that have any effect on me now? In fact, within probably 60 seconds of drinking that can of Coke, it would be gone from my consciousness. I could enjoy it for a few seconds. Even then, I'd probably be drinking my Coke and eating my ice cream and fruit and other things. So how much pleasure, how much effect would that can of Coke have had on my life? would have been zero, other than that couple of minutes. But by giving that can of Coke to the novice for the sake of enlightenment, for the sake of growth, for the sake of the practice, then it sticks in my mind. That makes a statement to myself, oh, this practice really is something that's worthwhile, something that's worth doing, something that's worth treasuring and taking pleasure in, taking joy in. So that can of Coke now has given me boundless more happiness, and it makes for a good story in Dharma talks. So, <laughs> so this idea of, uh, of the little action that we're doing is going to have a, a bigger effect is very important with any kind of spiritual growth, um, but especially with the, the holy life, turning the attention inside and finding the path to enlightenment. So the practice is this humble practice. Giving away a can of Coke isn't a great thing. I could have been a great businessman and earned billions of dollars like Bill Gates, and now he has this big, beautiful foundation where he sponsors things that he likes, that he values around the world. That's a pretty good reason to get rich, in a way. I think he's quite a good role model in that sense. But however much he gives away, it's not going to be as effective as my can of Coke. <laughs> that's my excuse anyway. That's, uh, uh, so the practice is quite humble. When your consciousness gets stationed at something, you make a note, realize that, reawaken, bring your attention back to yourself. When attention gets stationed somewhere, your awareness gets restricted, refined, and lands on that thing and gets tied to that thing. So while you're looking at something, thinking about something, engaging with something, it's going to be very important to you, uh, out of all proportion to reality. So you get caught up in TV programs, you get caught up in conversations and newspapers and uh, just painting your house and all kinds of things that are perfectly okay. These aren't immoral or unnatural things. But all the time, you're training your mind to get stationed outside of itself. And what happens is the moment where your mind isn't stationed somewhere, you like, you have that thing that you look around like, oh, I feel a bit uncomfortable. And then you're like, right, what do I do now? And then poof, you go and station your mind somewhere else. If I'm Facebooking, not Facebooking, Photoshopping, that wasn't a Freudian slip. If I'm photoshopping something, which is where I get engaged, hours and hours I'm gone. But when I get, at some point, I'll suddenly get self-awareness will return. And I'll be like, well, right, you know, what's the time? Like, oh, I, I could do the cup of tea. Like, oh, I need the bathroom. How come I didn't know I needed the bathroom 30 seconds before that? Right? You're always, you're sending your mind out, getting it stationed, engaged with something. Well, this feeling when the mind returns, when you break that stationing of consciousness with your action and the mind returns, that's the feeling, that's the quality that we are trying to aim for. And all spiritual practices of Christianity, uh, Hinduism, Sufi, all of it, all aims at this one door, 
In Buddhism, it's called the door to the deathless. This point where you just have the attention returned and you get that moment of wakefulness, of awareness, and immediately throw your mind into some other thing. But what if you keep that mind there? What if you train yourself in that awareness? Then that awareness starts to grow, starts to become more comfortable. The reason it's uncomfortable is at, fir at first is you're not used to it. That's all it is. You're just not accustomed to feeling yourself. You like to be absorbed in other things. If you go to the movies and you watch a movie, the difference between a good movie and a bad movie, it's got nothing to do with the actor. It's got nothing to do with the director. It's got nothing to do with whether it's a 3D film. <laughs> you know, We had a Dharma talk with Ajahn Pasano one year, and I phoned up somebody who I knew would be interested to go. I said, you know, we have this Dharma talk with Ajahn Pasana. He said, yeah, yeah, I can't make it. And it sounded a bit suspicious the way he said it. It wasn't like, oh, dash, I've got something to do. He's like, yeah, I can't quite make it. I was like, what's so important? He said, I, I have to go out. Like, what are you going out to do? And he's like, uh, fine, I'm going to see Avatar. <laughs> I said, you can see Avatar any time. Ajahn Pasano is only here now. He said, yes, but Bante, it's in 3D. <laughs> I said, Ajahn Pasano is in 3D. <laughs> more exciting, more interesting, right? So this is uh, our tendency is to go and find something more exciting, more engaging. So the difference between a good movie and a bad movie is did it suck you in or not? If you get sucked into that story, you're going to come out of it feeling that you enjoyed yourself, even if it's a horror story, right? People like horror stories and tragedies just as much as they like comedies and action movies because the key quality is you just don't want to be aware of yourself. You want to station your consciousness somewhere else. When it's somewhere else, you feel happy. Have you ever noticed when you're suffering, your consciousness comes back here, right? It's difficult to get your mind anywhere else when you're suffering, when you're unhappy. So dukkha has that quality. It's, it's almost like a signal telling you you have to return your attention to yourself. So that's it. That's the one Dhamma talk that I think I'll have left pretty soon, is watch this process where you're stationing your consciousness out on different things, on activities, on food, on sounds and music and all these kind of things. And what happens when you turn that around and just return to the simple presence? It doesn't seem like very much. This is a handful of beans. This is why Jack got hit across the head by his mother. She doesn't value the handful of beans or the blessings that it's going to bestow. In the same way, this feeling of just being with yourself doesn't feel like very much. Luke Skywalker in uh, Star Wars, do you know his tool? This little farm boy has to defeat the evil empire that runs the entire galaxy, and he's given a tool, a lightsaber, and that's it. He has a little sword thing, right? That's, how he, that's his tool that he's going to have to win the battle with. So this is our tool, this simple, clear mindfulness. When the attention is returned, when you're not stationing your consciousness out on activities, that's it. It doesn't seem like very much. It doesn't sound like very much. But all spiritual traditions will go through this point. Uh, now, the next part to this story is something that doesn't very often get talked about in Buddhism, so this is why I wanted to bring it up today. Uh, and this is why I came up with the title, which was Slower Light, right? Is that why you came, my, my jazzy title? <laughs> Sometimes it works. Um, I don't know. Uh, slower Light, I, had, I read this experiment some time ago about where the uh, light is in quantum mechanics is photons, and photons travel supposedly at the speed of light. They actually don't. Light doesn't travel as fast as light, but uh, the photons will travel, 
But depending on the medium they're traveling through, they'll slow down or speed up. So photons traveling through air will travel at close to the speed of light. But traveling through glass, they will slow down. And this is how a prism works, where the light goes in and gets bent to the side. So they did this experiment where they were trying to slow down light. And so my imagination got caught with this. Like, what would slow light look like? If you could slow all those photons down to a stationary, just to be still, what would it be like? A bucket, a bucket of stationary photons. I think, and I know I'm wrong, and it makes no physical sense whatsoever, even quantum mechanics can't justify my belief, but I think that bucket of photons would glow. I think it would shine. If you could slow it all down to nothing, I think they would still shine. That doesn't make any physical sense, but I'm absolutely sure it's true. So what happens with the, the mind? The mind is as quick as light, as quick as you can think of it. Your mind can be in Brazil, it can be in Mars, it can be 20 years in the past. The mind moves that fast. So what does the mind look like if you would slow it down and make it stop still? In theory, by any physical theory, you'd think when you slow it down, it kind of ceases to be. But the actual experience when you slow the mind down with that mindfulness, you're not stationing your doubt anywhere, is the mind starts to get brighter and brighter and clearer and clearer. And this doesn't often get uh, talked about. One reason is if we say sit down and make your mind very bright and very clear, and your mind is just like, no, 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 no. You're not having that experience, and then you think, oh, how do I make it bright? So then you start trying to manufacture it and change it, and that's not going to work. So I think that's one reason why it rarely gets mentioned. But those moments when, if you keep restraining your mind, and the Buddha used this word, restraint. He used restraint and control, which is very interesting. A lot of Vipassana teachers these days don't use those words. If you restrain the mind and bring it back, when the eye goes out to a sight, when the ear goes out to a sound, when the nose goes out to a smell, the tongue goes out to a taste, the body goes out to bodily feeling, and the mind goes out to a thought, uh, what happens when you catch that and return your attention home? It may seem like initially, remember, Jack went to bed because he only had five beans. So initially it seems like well, you've traded in a beautiful, magical world for, like, not very much. But this is our practice. And bit by bit, you start to get aware of yourself when you're not engaging with things. You get aware of what this feeling is, what the experience is, when you're not experiencing things outside. And a lot of meditation teachers teach people to reject all experience, but I want to make really clear that there are certain times with meditation that when the mind comes together, called ekabhava, it literally means becoming one. When the mind comes back home and it becomes one and it's not reaching out to station itself with things, what happens is you get brighter and brighter and clearer and clearer. And the sense of presence, the sense of life starts to really like explode it can get even scary at times. There's so much energy starts to suddenly become available that it can be quite scary. I'm kind of at that point myself. I'm getting better now because I can trust it. But uh, The Buddha had an analogy for this, and this goes straight back to Sakyamuni Buddha himself. He said, imagine a spring that comes up out of the ground, and the water, as it comes out of the ground, would go off, leak away, in one of six different directions. What if a person was to come and build a little dam around that spring? What would happen? The water does not go leaking off in those directions. Then the water would accumulate and form a pond, such as a crow could come and drink of it. I like that analogy of a crow, because crows have difficulty finding fresh water. They you might be able to see a river, but the crow can't 
get to the river. It needs somewhere where it can actually stand and peacefully, calmly, carefully partake of the water. So this analogy of so that a crow might partake of it means that slow carefulness of the mind gives you that thing that, that you need. So then the water accumulates and it becomes useful. If one were to break that dam in any point, the water would go rushing in that direction. And the Buddha said, this is what happens when you restrain your mind from the six senses, which the six directions the water flowed in. When you restrain your mind from the six senses, from each sense, you keep bringing it back. What happens is the consciousness or the life force starts to grow and become very apparent so that you can participate in it, you can partake of it. And you feel this growing of energy, this growing of power, of brightness, that's not dependent on something external. For example, in the morning when you wake up, you're probably not very bright, right? You're like, like this. You know, I have my students in university, and if you take a look on my Facebook, what I like to do is when they fall asleep in class, I go along and I take a selfie <laughs> together and then I put on Facebook. <laughs> so people really like my Sleepy Monks folder, so go and have a look. So in the morning you wake up and you're like that, like until you get your coffee and then you get, get a little bit more awake. So normally your wakefulness or presence or aliveness depends on the thing that you're engaging with, right? So if you're watching some TV program that you don't like, your mind's going to slow down. If you've had your dinner already, you'll probably fall asleep. If it's engaged with something that you like, then you, your mind will spring up. So this quality of aliveness or awakeness for ordinary people depends solely on the object solely on where they place their attention. You place your attention on something exciting, it starts to feel exciting. If you place your attention somewhere that is dull or that you are not interested in, you start to sink down and fall asleep. But this is fundamentally different. This is not putting your attention with anything. This is attention being with attention. Yourself being with yourself, your mind being with your mind. This is you're not going out anywhere. And what happens is it starts to get bigger and bigger, brighter and brighter, clearer and clearer. The second thing that happens is that you get a sense of the body being present. And the sense of the body may be very clear or it may be fairly faint, but you definitely have a sense of a body sitting here. This body may feel larger. It may feel smaller. Uh, it may feel like it's made out of light. It may appear in your consciousness just as part of it. So sometimes you just feel your hands. Did you ever have this when you're meditating? And you're sitting, uh, usually when you're falling asleep a bit, and you're starting to go, and then, and you might feel that your hand is very large. Um, and then the rest of the body is kind of disappeared. However it is, the feeling or the sense of the body should start to get clearer and clearer and brighter and brighter. So these two things are two things that I like to mention because they're things to look out for when your practice is going in the right way. And very often with meditation teachers, they tell you anything that you can see, reject it. Well, no, that's when your mind gets stationed outside of yourself. But when your mind isn't moving out, there is still experience there. It's not what we call the dial tone from God when it Like that's not what happens when you bring your mind back from going out through the senses. What happens is it gets brighter. So I want to make these two things clearer, that there are, you have a strong body awareness. And this is why things like yoga, uh, qigong, even exercise or going for a walk, Things that get your attention into your body are very spiritual in many ways. Maybe not if you're a boxer. Uh, are very spiritual in many ways. Why is it that, that going for a walk is considered more spiritual than watching Gilmore Girls 
season one to eight on TV. <laughs> Gilmore Girls is my favorite TV program ever. <laughs> I went to the park here the other day. I walked from here over to the science labs over that way. Can, I forgot the name of the park. Not, not Holt Park, it's further over that way. Kensington or something like that. Kenridge. So I walked through the park there. Uh, the sign said it was 47 hectares of park. Everybody agrees that parks are good. Uh, the UN, even when they grade cities on how livable cities are, one of the things that they measure is the amount of park per person. And like England has three, uh, London has three square meters of park per person. I want to know where my three square meters is. <laughs> Bangkok has something like half a square meter per person. They don't like parks. So here you have some parks, and I went out onto the park. We all agree parks are good. We all agree that going out in the trees is good. We all agree that we would like our city to have parks. Not a soul to be seen <laughs> in the park. Nobody. I saw four people. Three of them were workers. <laughs> What's wrong with you all? <laughs> we all agree that malls, shopping malls, we don't need any more shopping malls. We all agree that shopping malls all are exactly the same, sell exactly the same things to exactly the same people. And we all agree we don't need any more of them built. The shopping mall, packed. <laughs> packed with people. So why is it that we consider going into the park and just walking? It gets you into your body. So the body awareness was always key in uh, Buddhism. It even has its own sutta called the Gayakata Sati Sutta. Um, bringing the attention into the body is a uh, key part to the practice. And as the attention stops moving out, you will get a stronger body awareness and you get a stronger awareness of brightness will arise. So the sutta uh, that relates to this was a sutta, a teaching that was given to Anuruddha. Anuruddha was the Buddha's cousin. And there's an interesting story of Anuruddha. He was my hero in the suttas. Uh, he's my favorite character. And he was one of the Buddha's cousins. And the Buddha had gone off, uh, or the Siddhartha Gautama had left, uh, the little kingdom and gone off, done his ascetic practices, got enlightened, got a few disciples, given a few teachings, and then he went back to his hometown and to teach his relatives, to, to introduce what he discovered. Because if you discover something great, you want to tell your friends, right? So he goes back and his relatives see him and they're worried that this is their supposed leader supposed to be the, the, the next king of the little kingdom. And here he is living out in a forest with wild animals and robbers and, and dangerous things. So they make a decision that a bunch of the guys are going to have to ordain as monks to go and stay with the Buddha to, make, to protect him, make sure he's okay, because he's still supposedly their king. So Anuruddha is one of these people and he's and while they're having the conversation and he says you know what guys I've had this really good idea agreed that we're going to have to send some people to ordain as monks and look after the Buddha or Siddhartha as they called him he said so I've had this really good idea you guys can go and become monks and look after the Buddha I'm going to stay here in the kingdom and be in charge and this made sense to Anuruddha so I can't remember who it was, but somebody said to him, okay, Anuruddha, what are you going to do? And he said, well, I'll, get, I'll look after the harvest and we'll get the harvest in and then I'll be happy. And then they said to him, okay, after you've got the harvest in, then what are you going to do? He said, well, then we have to prepare for winter, store the grain and the food and get ready uh, and then I'll be happy. And they said to him, but... Then what do you do, Anuruddha? He says, well, then we're going to have to prepare for spring, get all the seeds ready for planting, 
uh, we're going to have to till the ground, plow the ground, and get the seeds in and plant the seeds. And he said, okay, I'll do that, and then I'll be happy. You probably guessed where this story is going, right? <laughs> what do you do then, Anna Rode? He said, well, then we have to uh, nurture the seeds and water the seeds and make sure the plants come up, and so on and so forth. And they kept asking, what are you going to do then? What are you going to do then? Until he was back to getting in the harvest, which is where he'd begun. And then he said to his relatives, he seems like a very chipper guy, this uh, Anuruddha. He says to his relatives, you know, I've had a new idea. It's even better than my old idea. You guys can look after the kingdom. I'm going into the forest <laughs> to stay with the Buddha. <clears throat> so... I, I really like this sutta because this story because it encapsulates the idea of nipita, which I think I mentioned earlier, disenchantment. When the world no longer ha is so enchanting, uh, when every different kind of food that you can eat, and now you realize it's one tongue, every different kind of sight that you can see is so beautiful, you realize now it's just two eyes. So you get this disenchantment. The world is no longer enchanting like it used to be. And this disenchantment is a key quality that is supposed to be developed. Do you know the story of Yasa? He was uh, in early on in the suttas. He was walking along and he got disenchanted with the world. And he's like, oh, this is disenchantment. This is distress. And then he met the Buddha and said, this is not stress. This is not distress for you. This is the beginning of the holy life. So, Anuruddha and five of his friends, four other princes, and their barber, the guy who cuts their hair, all decided they were going to ordain as monks, and they had the barber cut ordained first, because whoever ordains first has seniority. So they wanted to give up their, their hierarchy of seniority and have the barber uh, ordained first. This is a very significant point in India with the caste system and etc. So Anuruddha, that was how Anuruddha came about. He uh, finally became known as the greatest of the Buddha's disciples for the divine eye. So he developed these psychic powers that he could see heavens and hells. And uh, so he was considered the greatest or the best at this particular psychic power. Anyway, in the sutta, he comes along and he uh, meets the Buddha. He's already ordained as a monk. And he says to the Buddha, sometimes I see uh, bodies. Sometimes I see the body. And sometimes I see light. But then very quickly, those, the body and the light disappear and I can't find them. What is it that I should do? Right. So the... Uh, Buddha replies to him, uh, what, you have to investigate what is the cause for the body and the light that you see uh, disappearing on you. And when you put away that cause, then you can concentrate the mind and attain to the holy states. So there's a whole list of reasons. Um, they're not too important, but I can tell you some of them. So the Buddha says to Anuruddha, I myself had exactly the same situation. I would abide diligent, ardent, and resolute. And I would perceive limited light and limited form of the body, sometimes by the whole night or the whole day. And I would think, what is the cause and condition from this? And I realized that the cause and condition for this experience dissipating was my doubt. And when I abandoned doubt, then I could see the light and the body. He said, I investigated again when it disappeared, and I found the cause for that to be the imperfection of the mind. When I understood that, I put aside the imperfection of the mind. Again, the body and the light would disappear, and I understood the cause of that was inattention. So I paid attention to it and the, was percipient of the body and the light again. The cause was sloth and torpor, sleepiness, 
The cause was fear. The cause was elation. The cause was inertia. The cause was excess of energy. The cause was deficiency of energy. The cause was longing. The cause was a perception of diversity. All of these things I found as causes for the perception of the body and the light to disappear. When I put aside those causes, then the body and the light would remain percipient, would remain strong. This, by the way, was Sutta, if some people like to look up, uh, 120 in the Majjhimanikaya. So if you want to look up, you're welcome to. So I want to uh, leave this with you as a um, clear instruction with the meditation. The meditation is quite easy. One way or another, we're going to have to withdraw the senses back in to this inward journey. When we do, when we are willing to give up all experiencing, what happens is you ex ha still have experience. The experience of becoming present should become clearer and brighter, and you should be, have some kind of feeling or understanding or knowledge that the body is right there. I'm going to finish off with a story. A uh, true story was in my temple. My abbot, or the person who gave me ordination, uh, was very well known for his... Uh, he was a genuine meditation master, and he had a lot of attainments. And we're not allowed to talk about these things while they're still alive. But he passed away a few months ago. <laughs> so now I can tell you the stories. I can tell you what uh, had happened. So there was one day... Uh, he, by the way, would always teach this exact form of meditation. You bring your attention in. You focus either on a light in the center of the body or you focus on a tiny little body in the center of your body. And this was what he said, continually bringing your attention in and down like this. So I went to the evening chanting one day and I was late. And I was a bit ashamed of being late. And so there's a large Buddha statue in the hall and all, he would sit in front of the Buddha statue and the monks would be lined up on either side and the lay people in the middle. But behind the Buddha statue was also a bit of space. It was a very big hall, so something like this much space behind the Buddha statue. So I came in late and I was too ashamed to let him see me coming in late, right? So I went and took my seat behind the Buddha statue so that he wouldn't notice. Because if, if he sees you, he'll notice. But if he doesn't see you, he'll never know that you weren't there. <laughs> yeah, sneaky monks. So I went and made, had my seat there at the back, and I started doing the meditation. Now, he would always give the meditation instructions in Thai. It was always the same instructions every single night, never changed. And he would give in Thai, but if he saw a Westerner there, he would give some instructions in English. He's a fairly fluent English speaker. Sometimes you have to warm him up a bit, but um, he, worked, uh, he worked as a spy for the US government for 30 years. It's called the United States Information Service. <laughs> I like to call him a spy. Um, so working for the US government, his English was pretty fluent. So I went in and I sat there behind the Buddha statue while he's facing forwards. Started to do my meditation and I could f suddenly feel the humming and buzzing of the body and it kind of felt bright. But what ha was happening is it would, this would keep dissipating, falling out of my experience. And I'm like, so I was starting to try really, try, you know, is that it? And I was eh, trying to catch it. And of course, the more you try, the more it disappears. And just at that moment, he, he started talking in English. <laughs> I'm the only Westerner there. And I'm sat behind a massive Buddha statue where he can't see me. And he said, yes, yes, that's exactly the right way. Now go into that light body. Just go into the center of that body and relax in that body. My hair is standing on end. <laughs> like, 
But then I thought, well, I, I must be doing it right. So I was like, mm, and, but I was straining in a way that didn't feel right to me. I could kind of get this funny experience, but I was like really putting too much strain into it. And I was like, nah. And then he said, no, no, just relax with it. Just relax with it. Go into the center of the center of the center. Go into that body. Allow it to become very bright. And I was like, ah. And this went on for about five minutes. And then I, you know what I did? I said, I wish you just off, right? Because I felt very invaded, right? I was like, just go away. <laughs> And he said, oh, oh, okay, then you carry on as you know the practice. And then he flipped into Thai. <laughs> and then I was like, sorry, 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 I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, that, so it's just a, a, a story of something that happened. Um, I snuck out after the puja, so I didn't see him. And he never mentioned it, and I never mentioned it, so... Uh, but it does show that these, ex these experiences, that was when I was very new as a monk. I was only like about six months in the monastery. But it shows that these experiences do start to come. Uh, but what's important is that you're able to recognize it and be with it. You're able to stop still in the right way to foster the right experience. That when you're doing this practice of withdrawing the senses, not allowing your mind to go out, at some point, the mind will start to get very bright, will start to get very clear, and you will get this very strong body awareness. Okay, I'm going to stop there. What? No. I've told you about ten stories already, so... I'm not Yes. Yeah, give them the mic. What if you're doing mindfulness of the breath? Yes, and people say that they pay attention to the breath and say the body disappears. Right. So the question is that sometimes people say that you can pay attention to the breath until the body disappears. Uh, what happens when you concentrate on anything, everything else disappears. So if you concentrate on climbing a rock face, then, then your past disappears, your thoughts, your ego, your lunch, all of these things all disappear. So if you focus very strongly on the breath or on any other object, what will happen is it will start to disappear. A second thing that happens is the mind will start to fall asleep. But you'll get a moment of wakefulness, of mindfulness, will come up while the mind's asleep. And what's happened is lots of your attention, lots of your experience has shut down. The brain has kind of shut it all down. So you suddenly get this little bit of mindfulness come up, and you can't even find the body. And then you're like, uh, and then it comes back, oh, phew, it's right there. <laughs> so it does happen, and it's a good stage in the meditation. Uh, if the body disappears, because it means that you are able to sit, be with yourself, restrain the mind, focus onto a meditation object. But I'm very, very clear, all the area states, all the real insights, the real progress comes, you'll be very, very aware, very, very bright, very, very present. Yeah. I used to get, that there's a thing, if you see the Tibetan uh, path, they have an a elephant and a monk and a monkey and uh, they're all walking along a path and as they go up the path, it starts to change. Have you seen this? You're not familiar with this? Okay. So I won't tell you that one then. <laughs> um, there is a state called false samadhi and on that path is represented by a hare hair as in a rabbit, not as a hair of the head. And the false samadhi is you get to a point where you can sit and the mind starts to shut down many functions and then you're like, 
and then you're not quite sure if you're awake or not awake. You're not quite sure if you're aware or not aware. And then the bell rings, and you're not quite sure how long that you were sitting there for. That's called false samadhi. And what's happening is the functions of the mind are shutting down, but you've still got enough awareness to be kind of with yourself and aware. And people can go for years in this false samadhi. Many teachers talk about, don't do it, it's a cul-de-sac, it's a dead end. It is a dead end of practice, but that's what you have to do, in my opinion, right? You have to find where the dead ends are. My analogy is, if you have a child and they're playing with Lego, and they, one day they make a spaceship, you're like, oh, that's, that's, that's really good, and the next day they just make a stupid blob that has no... F you don't say to that child, no, that's the wrong thing. You let them do it, and making the wrong thing is part of learning how to use Lego. Same with meditation, is going down some of these dead ends is how you know where the limits of the mind are. So it's uh, that kind of state where things start disappearing um, is, shows that you're making progress, but it's also a dead end. Yeah. Anybody else have any question? This is our time for questions and answers. Yes. The what? Oh, the whole story is a bit long. <laughs> um, but what I do want to do is uh, maybe next time I come, I might do like a series. So we'll do like five or six of the fairy tales. Because uh, it takes a while to get into the way of thinking. And they're really good fun as well. Uh, things work better by images than they do by intelligence. So for example, someone can tell you something a hundred times, but you're like, eh. But if you see an example of it, it will work much better. So this is why we like stories so much. A strong story character will go into your consciousness and motivate you much more than just intellectually understanding something. The Buddha himself used stories too in, in exactly this way. The Buddha defines right concentration as jhana. However, there are various teachings about what jhana is. The methods to practice and the signs to observe, etc., differ from one another. Amidst all of this diversity, how can we understand right concentration and the right way of practice? Uh, there are two main forms of concentration. One is by freezing the mind onto an object. And the second is by the mind not going out to anything. So what I've been talking about is where the mind doesn't go out to anything. This also is jhana, is a concentration. The way my teacher put it to me, he said, when you concentrate on an object and you attain to very deep concentration on that object, the mind will stop still and will become very happy and have some interesting experiences. But the mind can't move. And if the mind can't move, it won't get insight. So when the mind stops still by itself without grasping onto anything, so you can also concentrate to the same degree, but the mind can move and you can use it for vipassana, for insight. Uh, in the meantime, in terms of concentration, just do what you can. Um, I don't think there's necessarily a right way and a wrong way. There's your way. There's your experience. And I would trust that more than I would trust anything else. What teachers tell you and things... Like I can tell you my experiences with things, but that might not relate to you. So um, I never trusted really anything my teachers ever said. <laughs> um, if you do, just trust the teacher. is probably better. But for me, I don't recommend it. I want to feel it out myself. So when I know it, I know it because I know it, not because somebody else knows it. So I wouldn't worry too much about concentration and what people say and how it works. It may appear differently to you. Just do your practice. Concentrate when you concentrate. Sometimes you'll say, you know what, I need to really improve my concentration. Um, 
if you have a job, a work to do or school to go to, concentration is really good because sometimes you need a power meditation. If you have 20 minutes and you sit there just being very peaceful, it's not so good. You want to do a really good 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. But if you have all day, then you can do a different practice. So um, at different times through your time, you'll take up a practice from different teachers in different ways. Practice on meditating with light, practice meditating with the body. Another teacher says, just do walking meditation. So how can you say who's right and wrong? This is the question and, and answer period, so. Hi, Bhante. Uh, just now I mentioned about uh, whenever our mind wander out, we should bring it back. Because, I mean, that is a, you know, by default, our mind tend to wander out or distracted by something outside that's exciting. So, uh, at what stage should we actually, you know, uh, is it like by forcing our mind back to, 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 to ourselves, or this should be a gradual process? I understand that it gets easier as we improve in our meditation. We become more yeah. aware when our mind starts to, mm. you know, start to go off. So, we catch it before it even wander off or yeah. get involved. That's one. And just now, the other aspect you mentioned about light and brightness, is that part of vipassana insight we're talking about? Okay, so the word the Buddha used was not forcing back. He, yeah, he used restraint. the word restraint. So restraint, uh, but you also take a bit of effort for the restraint yeah. to work as well. It takes a lot of effort. Yeah. yeah, that's right, especially for beginner. So, But uh, my main concern is that just now I mentioned about tiny body, you know, like this coming in with an eye body, is it observing the observer mind? Yeah. The, the in vipassana, because this is how I understand, you know. What happens when the mind isn't, going, isn't engaging with any object? Yes. What will happen is it will become brighter yeah. and based from the center of the body. Yes. So you will have a sense of light and a sense of the physical body. You mean uh, we'll there'll arrive. be images of light, or you'll be like your mind is clearer. The mind is clearer. It's just I can't say any other way than there's a <laughs> sense. Okay. It's not like it appears as a vision. Yes. As some supernatural vision or mm. some mental vision. No, you just like when the mind's not going out to anything. It's just like, oh right, it's right there. That mean it's the right mind there. is with you. You're with the mind. The mind is with the mind. Yes. Okay, got it. Uh, and not going anywhere. Uh, my, the way my teacher would do it, actually, he would say that you can imagine things to get your mind into the right place. He said that when the mind does stop going out to anything, then it will be aware from the center of the body and there'll be a body awareness. But what he would do is tell you to visualize things in the center of the body. So. Uh, you can visualize, uh, the Dalai Lama had this one, he, he said you visualize a, a tiny little drop-sized Buddha in the center of your body. Uh, he said that if it starts to go up, you imagine it's very heavy. He said if it starts to go down, you imagine it's very light. So there are ways to manipulate, but um, I personally can't visualize things. I can't visualize anything. I understand how things work. Like in my mind, the Toyota engine, I can like, I know how it works, but I can't see it. But what I did find was I could imagine a grain of rice in the middle of my body. I don't know why. I don't even <laughs> like rice. Um, but it's only to get yourself into the right position uh, so that the mind's not going out. It's just a way to keep, help you keep bringing yourself back. Once you're present and once you're there, you don't need to do anything. Yeah. Anyone from there? No 
more Christians. All bright and alert and <laughs> over there. Um, I'm not sure how to phrase this. But is it always negative to have the constant chatter in your head or sometimes, you know, figuring out problems and things of that nature? Is it okay or should you, I don't know, wait for some other insight? No, sure. When you have something to do, then that's what the mind is there for. So you have to use it and engage it. Yeah. I just wrote my master's dissertation, uh, so 130 odd pages of dependent origination and gestalt psychology. So I really have to use my brain uh, for something like that. So yeah, the mind is there for a reason. Uh, the point is that it continues going even when you don't have a reason, right? Because it's just in that habit. So that um, you, know, you sit on the bus or you're waiting for something, your mind's still going, going, going. You go to bed, the mind's still going, going. You wake up, first thing that happens, your mind starts churning, churning. Because we don't understand the nature and uh, use of the mind. But yes, you have to apply it when you've something to do. Yeah. It's funny, most people don't notice the chatter in the mind. It's like only a meditator will notice that. Isn't that strange? The mind is chattering all the time, all day long, and nobody notices. Isn't that really strange? Only when you sit and you meditate and you say, okay, watch the breath, and the mind's like, no, I'm going to go chattering. <laughs> you like, and then people think that they can't meditate. They think that, oh, my mind's too busy. But that, that's the same mind that you're carrying around the whole time. But you're deluded by it into thinking that mind is you. When you meditate, and you see the mind, you said watch the breath and the mind has other ideas. The mind has a mind of its own, right? And the mind goes off and starts chattering. Suddenly you're seeing the mind as not you. And that's the first insight. And a lot of people miss that. They think, oh, well, my mind is too chattery or I have to stop my mind down. No, the insight, the thing that we're getting at is to see that the mind isn't you then what are you aside from the mind? You'll only see that when the mind does stop and you're clear and bright and you realize I'm still here even when the mind isn't chattering, even when I'm not moving. I don't want to get confused with the word I and atta. Anatta means you see the mind as not you. Right? Doesn't mean that you have no experience left when you get enlightened. You, you, the experience should get stronger and brighter. I might say that all this talk on body, since you're a yoga teacher, right? Um, I came late to it because uh, I'm a Gemini. Geminis don't believe in astrology. And we're very mental based and I'm like that, I'm in my head. And to me, the body was this long dangly thing, just useless dangly thing underneath my mind. So I'm very much a mental person. And so I came late to this kind of practice of bringing the attention into the body, uh, which is a shame. It's really like so central to the practice. Yeah. Thank you, Bhante. And my question is, um, just now after the Qigong practice, um, you know, we, we sat down for meditation. So at that point, um, the sense of presence in the body was quite um, strong. Yeah. So you can really feel it. So does it mean that we can just, just focus on the, sen the sense of being, being in the body without focusing on the breath? Yes. So we yeah. don't have to latch on the breath and bring awareness to the breath? Correct. Yeah. Okay. The breath was considered a, a body focus. So when we talk about mindfulness of body in Buddhism, breath is one of those. Uh, but also focusing on the body as four elements, um, focusing on the body as unpleasant, as a sealed bag of skin with nine orifices filled with unpleasant things. This was how the, we don't normally teach you that one. <laughs> um, so there are a lot of 
uh, these different body meditations. But at the end of the section on all body meditations, it says, all else, he is simply aware that there is body to a degree sufficient for awareness and attention. So all of these other practices were things to get your attention to the body. But if it's there, that's all you need, just that general ease of being in the body. Yeah. So at that point, you don't need the breath, you don't need reflections. But I find that I can't sustain so long and it's like my mind will start to be bored. You know, yeah, and then that's the trouble. I want to go back to the breath again because it's more tangible. Yeah. So, is it, it, so it's, it's normal. That's or do normal. We, do we yeah. go back, try to go back yeah. to the physical sense again? Yeah. Um, it might help you to bring light into the meditation because uh, that really helps to center it also. That may be useful. What does happen is at some certain times, everything will collapse because the world that you carry around with you is created by yourself. So at certain times, everything will just collapse and suddenly you'll be like left there, awake and present. And you have to be very sharp to catch this experience. But when you do, you catch that experience, your sense of self or your sense of being doesn't want to be with the exciting things of the world because it's seen something better, purer, and more holy. And so what happens is your, your, yeah, your sense of presence will, at that point, quite naturally let go and circle around and go back to itself. But you have to be very awake and aware to, to know, to see when everything collapses and there's still this experience left over. So what happens is that you see that a few times and the mind starts to learn. It's like, oh, now I get the confidence that enlightenment is that way and not that way. Hmm. Okay, anybody else? Or should we wrap up? Yeah. Yeah. No All more questions. For the day? We can wrap up. No? Going, going? <laughs> Gone. Okay, so you, uh, everyone here now is the champion that lasted out the whole day. A uh, few people have been slipping away one by one. <laughs> what I think that they should do, you see, I think they should charge for these events and we structure it this way. Anyone who slips out an hour early pays $20. <laughs> Anyone who slips out after the meal pays $100, and anyone who doesn't make it through the morning pays 200 But if you make it to the end, then it's free of charge. <laughs> so you are the guys who made it to the end, so it's a very nice and a beautiful thing to come and practice with other people. As I said earlier, just planting those seeds, it might not seem like very much that you're doing. It's just five beans in the hand, but this is what is going to change you and accelerate your practice. Yeah. Okay. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, Bhante. Let's pay our respects. Uh, before I make some announcements, 